Welcome to Woodbine, if you've never been. Uh, as of yesterday, we started our sixth year uh, in the space, um, and we're currently doing um, a fundraising drive when we renewed the lease. Um, and basically why we started this space and why we continue to run the space is a group of people that had met each other in various political and cultural uh, worlds um, prior to those six years, um, decided that we needed to have a space to have events like this and have meetings and gatherings and talks and spaces of thought uh, like this. And um, we pay for the space out of pocket ourselves. We, we're not really a formal organization or an institution. We don't have any nonprofit status. We don't really have any funding. But I think it's you know really essential uh, in this moment um, and in, our, in New York City where a lot of us are from or grew up that we have spaces like this to think together sort of outside of the university, outside of our jobs and outside of our homes and relationships and various things uh, to come together and maintain a space like this and different kinds of things we've done together at the space and still do together. We have a, a monthly poetry reading series that Suzanne organizes called Crush. Um, we have dinners every Sunday night. Everyone here is welcome to stay for dinner. Um, they're open to the public uh, after seven. Uh, Duncan, uh, I think, is uh, leading the, uh, the menu tonight. Um, and that's been important for us also to maintain these dinners. We've done them since we started in early 2014. Um, to have a space, again, to meet and talk outside of uh, a meeting or outside of even an event uh, like this, just to come and kind of share food and basically to slow down, I think, is a big part of it because the city and the internet and social media and politics are constantly trying to force us to kind of speed up or keep up or kind of be urgent or be anxious. And to do something over food uh, necessarily, or to have a space necessarily, changes the rhythm or changes the temporality. And I think it's been important for us to maintain that, you know, to not have an agenda or a clear goal or a clear end, but just have the space or the kind of process or the time together to explore those things. Uh, other things we've done in the space, uh, we run a farm share in both the summer and the winter seasons, which is a kind of subscription um, system where we kind of relate to farms in the Hudson Valley um, to bring organic produce uh, to Ridgewood. Uh, we do that. There's maybe about 60 different families who are in our share. And the farm that uh, does the winter share now is a farm that members of Woodbine also help run and help farm in, in Columbia County in New Lebanon. It's a biodynamic farm, which is also a kind of cosmic uh, spectral uh, way of farming to think about. Uh, uh, we can get into that later. But um, other things we have run into the space, and I, I just mentioned this to give this feel because I think it also informed the discussion uh, that we wanted to have with Fred or Fred wanted to have with us. We have a kind of health group that meets and does things about community health. There's kind of different uh, health and wellness practices that Fernando helps run around meditation and yoga and different kind of um, body kind of practices that are kind of run out of the space. Um, there's a tech group that does stuff with um, cybersecurity, with uh, our relationship to the devices that kind of give us kind of misery uh, in our lives. But there's people who are experts on that, Mitch, and, and others who are kind of do things uh, with that um, the tech group. Um, and basically, um, other things we help start in the neighborhood. Basically, around there's about 20 or so people that help run this space collectively maybe another 20 or 30 or so who live with us in this neighborhood when we kind of decided to reorganize ourselves in Ridgewood after the experiences of both Occupy Wall Street as a social movement and Hurricane Sandy as a kind of catastrophic environmental event that we experienced in New York in the years before starting the space, we really made it clear that we didn't want to be kind of mediated in our friendships or relationships by the train system or the bus system or the time that it would take to get from work to our house and then from our house to another hour to our friend, and then the relationships just become one of text messages, or you know, oh, is Wednesday good or not? So by being in, in Ridgewood in the neighborhood and being within walking distance, it really enabled us to, to change that, to change that rhythm and dynamic. So we opened up a community garden uh, adjacent to the space that now exists at the public high school. We helped open uh, Topos, which is a bookstore and cafe around the corner. And um, basically we built the space and we built the kind of this affective environment or infrastructure in the neighborhood. Um, 
But a big part of that since the last year has been this kind of thought-based practice or this kind of um, what we call the research group, which is this weekly seminar that usually happens on Sundays, which is the context of this event. Because I think um, one of the things that's been taken from us or that, that's trying to be taken from us is uh, the possibility of thought itself. And I think with uh, Donald Trump and, and Instagram and Tinder and Twitter and all these things, they just deprive us of thought and deprive us of our kind of space or autonomy of, of just how to think and how to relate to each other and how to talk to each other at all. So we really wanted to carve out a space weekly on Sunday, you know, kind of like church, where we could come together and talk and think and eat outside of this kind of um, imperial kind of um, oppression that, that kind of exists uh, within, within the city, within our lives. Um, so there's a lot that we can elaborate on, we can talk about, and we wanted to have discussion. Um, but with that, we're really happy that, uh, that Fred agreed to come and share this time and space with us. So uh, please join me in welcoming Fred. Very happy to be here and to to get to know get to know this part of New York City, um, which I don't think I've ever been around here before. Um, I um well, so two things. First is originally the idea was that my friend Stefano Harney and I would come together and talk talk with y'all, but he is in a transitional period right now, so, so he couldn't make it. Um, he's actually uh, out of the country again and getting ready to go back to Singapore where he teaches. Um, so, um, but I'm here with his greetings and, and his regrets for not being able to, to be here today. Um, and the other thing is, even if he had been here, it's not like we, we would have come prepared necessarily. <laughs> so. Um, we just, um, so I, 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 don't, I don't have a, a speech to make or a talk to give, but, um, but, I'm, but I'm very curious, you know, about, about not just what, what Woodbine is doing, but what, what everybody else is doing too. And I'm happy to, like I said, just happy to be here and to, to, to to, to talk with with everybody so um, I know I know you've got some things that you wanted to talk about so maybe that's a way we can get started and then we'll see how, how it goes from there. Um, yeah and we hope that people also came with things they wanted to talk about we were kind of just brainstorming a bit uh, before about some of these um, dynamics one of the things that we were talking about before that you were a little um, in the book, uh, there, there's this distinction between uh, planning and policy you make. Mm -hmm. And you kind of, there's this reclamation of planning as this kind of communal collective temporality and rhythm and process versus policy as this kind of maybe more statist kind of authoritarian hierarchical way of thinking or way of thinking about time or, or governance. And I think it's interesting with the kind of political realm or political dynamic now, there's, um, this kind of young wave of sort of millennial so-called democratic socialists or something have kind of shifted more towards the policy in, in a kind of way you know, versus the planning. And not to set up this kind of opposition or something, but um, in the book, and I think one of the things I was thinking, if we think about planning as a kind of, as a way of life, way of life we want to share together versus policy as a kind of way of administration, way of administering the world. And the kind of limitations then of thinking about policy or kind of thinking about governance on the government's terms or thinking about administration. I'm just kind of curious about that. And, you know, we kind of talked about kind of modes of politicization and your kind of work around aesthetic experience or expression through kind of countercultural practices or countercultural worlds, subcultural worlds, ways of life, ways of living, whether that's punk or jazz or fashion or kind of zine making or skateboarding or whatever that may have been for various people and thinking about the kind of plans that take place within the friendships that are formed within these sort of countercultural spaces or all, you know, 
versus the sort of administrative kind of modality or something. So I'm curious if we could expand on that. Yeah, well, um, well, I think, you know, in, in the undercommons, when we started trying to talk about policy or governance, maybe, you know, we were trying to open up a, an, an inquiry into something that eventually maybe we'll be able to talk about in a bit more of a precise way. Um, so, so the question that we're sort of thinking about now is maybe beyond a, a kind of, well, what's, what is it that drives policy or, or governance? What are, maybe what are some of the more fundamental, not only political economic motivations for under, underlying you know, policy and governance, but also uh, even more what we might call sort of metaphysical or, or philosophical, um, uh, you know, assumptions underlying policy, and um, and obviously, um, I think where we're at now, what we've been thinking about over the last few years, is something sort of this happening at the nexus of ownership and improvement. Um, so. So one way to think about policy is that it's, it's it, beyond or maybe a slightly more articulated notion would be not that it's just about administration, but it's administration in the interest of, of improvement, of you know, op the optimization of whatever, of the object of policy, to make something more accessible, to make it work harder and more efficient to create avenues that help to increase the capacity to, to generate and to extract surplus. That all of these, that, that what's at stake is the idea that anything that is owned, anything that can be grasped, has to be optimized and made better, more available, more accessible, more, more productive. And, um, and so, that sense of the necessity of improvement is really deeply bound up, you know, in sort of early modern European conceptions of what it is to, to own property. But not just what it is to own property as if property were uh, conceived of as a set of objects outside of oneself, but it's also very much bound up with what it is to be involved, to have a self, to be able to actually claim a, 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 a normative and, and um, you know, separable self, um, that's all bound up with this notion of improvement to um, so self-help, self-betterment, eventually the entire sort of complex that we think about under the rubric of education um, in ways that, of course, allow us to understand that that entire complex is inseparable from the complex that we think about in terms of punishment or incarceration, all of these the very idea of rehabilitation, the very idea of um, all of these these notions are 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 bound up with one another, and so um, you know what we wanted to do then is to 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 see if it's possible to not just articulate, not really so much even to articulate a theory of planning that would go against the grain of these formations, but but rather to try to understand something of the history of planning. Because the more we study and the more we learn, the more we realize that it's not so much that there's, it's not that there's no necessity for theory, but that the theory that we desire is all bound up with in, and given in the history of a set of practices that we, that we, that we, that we, that we're aware of and that we study and that turn out to not be so much of a secret really after all. So, um, so yeah, I mean, it, you know, so when it comes to the, I didn't know that the, the, the DSA was on the, on the comeback trail. So I, I, I mean, I'm not, um, the students that I have, the young undergraduate students that I have are probably not, not DSA material. They're more like, um, they're hanging out with, you know, they're, they're more like what you were describing, man, as maybe how you were, or how maybe I was in there. You know, they're they're listening to you know to, to Jonathan Richmond, you know. So they're, they're 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 in a they're in a different space. But but I would say that uh, you know I'm, I'm 
one of the things that, that we've been interested in is just how intense, as, as you suggest, this regime of improvement of policy, of governance, how, how intense it is and how um, rapacious it is in the sense of, again, trying to, to gain access to everyone into every moment of our lives. And, and I certainly see it, you know, with my own kids that, um, you know, the, the, the intensity with which policy is conceived of as the only possible mode of social organization is, um, is imposed upon young folks now with a, with a really intense, vicious kind of, you know, um, force. And so it doesn't surprise me that, you know, that they, 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 people think that, you know, this is the only way to do things, you know? Um, we have to get out and knock on doors and get people to vote for this or that, you know, false alternative. And hopefully the false alternative that we choose will, will institute new forms of healthcare policy that will be humane or, you know, I mean, the fact that people think like that is not an accident is all I'm saying. So, um, I'm much more interested in the impulse to, to democratic socialism and what that says about the, those young folks than I am in like how it is that they imagine carrying out what they want to carry out. In other words, I figure if, if people are given access to uh, an, an alternative, to another way of thinking about things, that the impulse that they have, you know, is a good impulse. So really what you're describing, I think is just a really nice and important occasion for some kind of transgenerational discussion. You know? Sorry, I think I just went on for like 37 hours. <laughs> yeah, just quick, like what we were talking about before was, um, again, maybe this, this process of politicization when people are, or when maybe different generations were in their teens or college or something through counterculture and maybe we're spending time with just like freaks and had kind of strange interests through whatever and now there's this kind of generational thing of these millennials who are interested in like Medicare and I was just saying how it was so, it was so strange <laughs> to see like a 20 year old really like really invested in Medicare you know and just like a style like wow like I never gave a shit about Medicare you know when I was that age so it's just maybe even I'm not that old but this generational kind of gulf or gap to think like how are these like young people so invested in like policy or something but Anyway, yeah, but no. I'm not, it's not a critique, I was just saying, it's, it's interesting. I, I, I mean, <laughs> no, this is, this is, well, it makes me think, I mean, I don't know, I wish, <laughs> I feel so alone, I mean, <laughs> 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 he would have something but look I mean I, I'm, I feel like I'm saying stuff that that he would say better but but one of the books that Stefano wrote sort of under his own name is a book called State Work um, came out uh, I don't know 10 or 15, maybe oh wow man 20 years ago maybe now um, but 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 a lot of the ideas that we were thinking about it together in the undercommons, I think, derives from that book. So, so let's think about Medicare, for instance, and let's th imagine what if it turns out that Medicare probably they had maybe Medicare, the actual day to day. Let's say that there's something like a kind of lived experience of Medicare, which is separate from the administration of Medicare by, you know bosses and, and higher ups within the state or even and then and then also detached in various ways from you know from the sort of political economic structure of, of healthcare as a kind of private you know industry. Cause then we're talking about what happens when poor and working class and elderly people go to a clinic or an office and interact with other poor and working class people who work in that clinic. It's interesting to think about it. I don't think we have a very good picture of that and of how, how that happens and what happens in places like that. I think that to the extent that we've got sort of images of that kind of interaction in popular culture, 
they're always skewed towards the assumption of the, of the radical inefficiency, right? Of those kinds of interactions and of that general structure, right? So I'm thinking about, a, oh man, I can't think of the name of this movie. It's not such, such a bad movie. It's Tupac's last movie. Gridlock? Tim Ro uh, yeah. yeah, was it? Gridlock. Gridlock. Yeah. So remember the kinds of interactions that, it was an interesting movie in part because one of the things it shows is like, people going to the unemployment office, right? People going to the, uh, to the hot, to the emergency room, right? These kinds of, because it seems to me that that's where Medicare happens, okay? Not in, in the, in the not, not, on, not on MSNBC, you know? Not in the discussion between Rachel Maddow and somebody else, so not, <laughs> not in Bernie Sanders' head. <laughs> where it actually happens is in those kinds of interactions. And it seems to me that the culture that we live in has a vested interest in, in showing those interactions to be as degraded mm -hmm. and as inefficient as possible. And they might, and I'm sure that they are inefficient in various ways, I'm sure, because the people who are engaged in those interactions are operating under profound constraints. But my sense of it, but I spent a little bit of time in, in offices like that with my grandma, with my mom, and the, you know, and I, I know, I grew up within the, you know, maybe in a different sort of way, let's say, within within the context of what people, you know, call the Great Society or the War on Poverty, you know, those, those kinds of, um, you know, the sort of, the, the, the far out little edges of policy, so to speak, where, where what's really going on are, again, these interactions between folks and within very specific kinds of communities. And, and my sense of it is that those spaces are way more interesting than we give them credit for, and they're way more susceptible to something that we would think about under the rubric of planning rather than policy. Um, and it would behoove us to, to pay attention to those things. And it would also be cool if this younger generation thought about it in that way too. It doesn't, these are not free zones or, or un, uncontested spaces where it's just like little secret patches of socialism that I have no, it's not like I'm saying that. I'm just saying that where, where Stefano and I went to think about study and to think about planning, <laughs> we're in spaces like that. And these are spaces which are not pure, they're under duress, they're entangled with the state and with capital in all these ways, but that entanglement does not mean that they don't also constitute a radical and I think dangerous differentiation against the grain of those forces, which is part of the reason why these spaces have to always be under such duress. So, so I would want to Really, I'm, I'm interested, just because they're interested in Medicare, I guess what I'm saying, doesn't mean that, that they ain't interested in something, you know, let, let, uh, maybe, maybe, maybe they got something right, you know, maybe, maybe, maybe we need to get a little bit more interested in Medicare too, not, you know, in that way, and, and not just, you know, a whole, all these different, basically all these zones of interaction which under duress, both administered but also regulated by the state, actually constitute these possibilities for and, and structures of survival, okay, for, for, for regular folks. It, could it be better? Yes, of course. Should it be better? Absolutely. But that doesn't mean that these places aren't places where something really interesting and significant is going on in the interest of a more radical, um, more disruptive insurgency and all alternative. You know, another thing I wanted to talk about maybe Coming off of that, also in the book, you have this dynamic to think about debt and credit and the modes of kind of memory that are applied to, to both and the modes of imposition that are applied to both. And it's maybe it's about five years old or more that you're writing it, but you start to also talk about kind of algorithmic kind of governance, which I think over the last five or six years has really kind of um, expanded in ways that weren't totally imaginable. And to think about how that relates relates to space, I think a good example of that is uh, the stuff happening with Amazon now, and that's one of the things people are working on here. Woodbine has had to deal with um, this plan, this kind of policy that's kind of being forced literally on us by, by the mayor and the governor to, to bring Amazon's new headquarters to Long Island City. 
and to kind of think about blocking that or opposing that on, on two different fronts or many different fronts, both the world of Amazon as an entity, as a kind of algorithmic reality that, um, to be honest, we're, we are trapped within. We're not totally outside of Amazon. People use Amazon to watch TV or buy parents, buy presents for their grandma or whatever, you know, that are delivered instantly, but we kind of, we hate it and we hate ourselves for being part of it, you know. And then there's the kind of urban, geographic, literal, kind of political aspect of, of how this is being put um, by force, literally, actually, you know, both the mayor and the governor did it without kind of uh, traditional oversight and have been quite um, stubborn and recalcitrant about that there's no real way to oppose it, there's no way to, to go against it. But to think beyond more about the algorithmic stuff, I think, is to think about some of the stuff you were talking about with debt and kind of visibility and, and memory is the algorithms also kind of um, decide who and what is visible. And you talk about, um, there was something you wrote about, literally something, um, oh, governance is the therapy of your interests. And to think about, you know, how interests and relate to governance and how things are targeted to us and ads are targeted to us or the way we relate to, to social media. If we have, you know, there's this, dynamic of social credit, you know, that they're talking about in China with who can decide who can get on a plane or not or who has access to things. Or even here in uh, New York, this, there's a struggle now about cash-free stores, whether or not you can have a business that just won't accept cash or not. Now the city is finally deciding, you know, like, no, you have to accept cash, you have to accept paper money. Um, we had, BFO came a few years ago here, we talked about this idea of money and cash and it's become this dynamic where now only the poor people are the ones who actually have cash. Mm -hmm. You know, rich people have credit cards, so they have credit, basically, so they can exist in this algorithmic reality. And the only people who actually have money anymore are poor people. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's also this way of kind of visibility, or if there's a store that can not accept cash, mm -hmm. it's basically pushing away, you know, people they don't want to come into the store who don't have that, that apparatus or that kind of infrastructure of their life, you know, this credit thing, but mm -hmm. Amazon literally embodies all of these questions, you know, these kind of algorithmic things, these advertisements, the physical infrastructure, the kind of embeddedness with kind of this non-state actor that's embedded with the state in a way that the public or even the kind of democratically elected government can't kind of deal with, you know, so I think the Amazon thing for us, it just was announced a couple weeks ago, but it's really a crystallization of all of these dynamics of kind of algorithmic governance and the old and the new kind of both coming at us at one time. So I'm kind of curious to hear you talk about that. I think I have a kind of, my own personal tendency is to never give, you know, no. the state or capital any credit for anything. <laughs> <laughs> Like if they say if 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 everyone's trying to get us to acknowledge that they're doing something new, my impulse is always to try to see how it's not new at all. It's pretty old, and um, there might be new terms, um, and there might be new apparatuses and mechanisms. Um, but I don't know. One time with my mother and my grandmother, we were driving. Um, my grandmother lived in this small town in Arkansas, about 60 miles away from the border of Mississippi. And she had never been to Mississippi. She, um, she'd been at a lot of other places. She just never been, to, it wasn't like she had lived some shut in life. She just, cause it was just, cause Mississippi, you know, as bad as Arkansas was in 1935, Mississippi was in her mind beneath contempt, you know, and, you know, you just wouldn't go there. So we went across the Mississippi River and we're driving up the Highway 61, you know, that Bob Dylan made famous after other people made it famous first. <laughs> and, uh, and we were looking at, the, uh, you know, there's still essentially cotton plantations. And this was 20 years ago, probably 25 years ago. Um, a lot of it was mechanized, but not all of it was. So there's a kind of, the shock as you're driving up Highway 61 is to see people still in those fields, you know, working cotton. But the shock is even more that it's the length of the rows. 
and the straightness of the rows. Um, I, there's an old phrase that, that I grew up pe with around people who used to say something about, about if something was, if, if, a, if a job that you were getting ready to embark upon was going to be tough and long, they would say that's a hard road to hoe. And um, and I realized what you know where that statement came from, you know, um, and I, and what I'm saying is, but as you look at the layout of the plantation, as if as you look at as the more we learn now about the mechanisms that were in place um, to perfect, you know, um, the the industrialization of 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 enslaved people. We realize that the algorithmic is is nothing new. It's 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 fundamental to the emergence of this nation as a political economic entity. There are, again, there are there are new technologies that help that that improve in some diabolical sense. You know, al the capacity for algorithm for the algorithmic to to again to create and to impose itself with greater and greater access on, on every life. But, 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 but that kind of calculated thinking, right, isn't, isn't new, okay? And I think it's important to say, A, that it's not new, and B, that it is not in the first instance. Well, in the first instance, it's not in the first instance. It's. It's it's a regulatory and reactive force. Okay, um, it, it 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 disciplines and regulates something that was there before it. Um, I mean, I just totally believe that. So, in, if if nothing, anything I could say, and I I, I think I can speak for <laughs> Stefano in this regard. Anything we say is predicated on those on those two beliefs. Okay, it doesn't mean that, and what does that mean? It doesn't mean that, that we don't pay attention to the new modes of, of algorithmic logic and, and imposition that emerge from day to day or year to year. We certainly do. But it means that um, I think it, it places a really profound imperative on us to pay attention to what we do, okay? So there's a couple of different um, Okay, so the thing about not having any cash. So I'm, I'm totally interested in this because cause now we think about it as a way of differentiating between, another way of differentiating between the rich and the poor, between those who have, and, and is, is it right to say that it's not a question of credit necessarily, well, credit cards, but a lot of times the no cash thing is it's Apple Pay, right? Or it's ATM things. And they ain't giving you credit. They, 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 what they have is immediate access to your financial, you know, condition. You know, they're, they're, it's not like a, a little. Mo it's, you're not, for the most part, unless with the credit card thing, you're not that the, 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 your your capacity to to use credit in the interest of buying this or that thing is 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 a limited thing. <laughs> but usually, if you pay with your ATM card, if you if you don't have it in there, then you, you can't get it. So that's that's they're just they just have easier access to, you know, that that moment that that the already given dematerialization that a dollar bill or a coin already instantiates is just now more efficient, right, and more easily transferable. Okay. Um, so that's that's not new. Um, what's also interesting is that the imposition. It, 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 the, the, the exclusion of poor people from that more easily identified. I don't, my sense of it is that, first of all, poor people, I think, have been under that kind of imposition for a long time. I'm thinking of the EBT card, yes. right? That was, that's, in other words, this new model for the wealthy or for the rich or for the haves is already predicated on the, 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 the ways in which that form of experimentation was imposed upon the poor. Right. So that's already, you know, that 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 implication of poor people, that that implication more specifically of within the context of the United States 
of black people, of black working people, or of black people who were never conceived of either as workers or as people insofar as they were slaves. This formulation, that, that, the imposition of those kinds of structures of financialization, that, that goes way, 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 way back, right? So it's important to be able to pay attention to what these people do, but it's also important to be able to, to know that what they do is usually not new. It turns out that the ones who make new stuff up are us, right? <laughs> you know, we, we're the one, we're the innovators, you know, which is part of the reason why capital, you know, in this very specific way can neither live with us nor live without us. Mm -hmm. Our innovations always constitute a profound threat, but our innovations are also the condition of possibility of surplus, of the, of, the, of the accumulation of surplus, these things. They go together. So what does that mean for us in terms of what our stance should be towards something like toward the Amazon thing? It's like, I don't know, you know, I'm, I'm, my tendency is to kind of, by the time something like this shows up for us as a battle, it's already over usually, <laughs> you know. But that is, does that mean, does that mean we shouldn't fight? No, I think not. It just means that the way you organize and the way you fight is really not so much about them as it is about us, you know. It's like mm -hmm. the question, be, the, these antagonisms create for us constantly the condition to renew what what our old good friend Manolo Callahan would say, it, these create conditions for us to renew our habits of assembly, right? Okay. Um, and so they become something like a foil for us. We're fighting a battle, but the battle that we fight is not usually and probably rightly, it's not on their ground. They got that ground. You know, um, but the question is, how can this constitute for us a way to, to reorganize ourselves um, and to enhance our own capacities for, um, for assembly and, and survival against and underneath the grain and the ground that, that Amazon already occupies, you know? Um, so, um, I, I don't think I was very clear with what I just said. Um, it's like the Montgomery bus boycott, okay? Um, what it did, more importantly than allow black folks to ride buses, <laughs> what it did was, is it, allow black folks to reorganize their own social relations. Mm -hmm. They, um, whether that was in the form of, you know, creating, you know, ride sharing or, you, you know what I mean? That, that's mm -hmm. what, and at the end of the day, what it is that we're fight, we, you know, we, we get together to fight so that we, and what, what are we fighting for? We're fighting to, to, to maintain our capacity to get together. So, um, I just don't, I just think it's really important that, that we organize ourselves in relation to, 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 to ourselves before we organize ourselves in relation to them. Mm -hmm. And sometimes there's a kind of righteousness and a kind of, you know, moral purity that people can imagine they have attained strictly as a function of the of the of the evil of their of their object the evil of their antagonist you know um and i think that's a that's a dangerous pathway to, to go down so um doesn't mean don't fight them it just means but when we're fighting them we're really dealing with one, ourselves so, um. i'm curious uh if if you think that there's a sort of total, that, that people possess a sort of limitless autonomy to be able to 
assemble and enact these liberating transformations on ourselves in moments of opposition to say something like Amazon, you know, to fight for the ability to continue to assemble. Mm -hmm. um, how that maybe comes into conflict with uh, the sort of involuntary material determinations of what it is to exist in, say, America or whatever position. Yeah. Okay, so, um, well, so maybe there's two different um, levels or valences of materialism that are embedded in your question, and one of them would be a kind of political economic materialism, or a, maybe a, you know, that would move along lines that we would associate with Marx, and, and it would say, you know, that, uh, you know, yeah, we have a certain limited autonomy at the level of the making of our lives or the making of our history, but they, but that, that it's always constrained and placed under very specific sort of material historical constraints. Um, and, and I, you know, it's, it's, I, that always seemed, you know, sort of uncontroversially true to me if I accepted the premises of the, the formulation and the premises of the formulation, strangely, you know, even with regard to Marx, even with regard to someone whose work does constitute a kind of a bulwark or a challenge a to, or again, you know, against or, or a challenge to, you know, uh, what people used to call individualism, let's say, but, um, but strangely, you know, the individual subject, the individual worker, maybe that's the metaphysical foundation of Marx's work, you know, um, still. Um, that, that there is finally in Marx even uh, uh, a philosophical commitment to the idea or the theory of the subject. And that would then mean that, um, you know, that, that, that Marx is a philosopher who operates within a general history of, of, of subjection and, and understands history is moving in that, in, along those lines by way of those you know, mechanisms and apparatuses. Um, and, and, you know, and you can, there's a lot of brilliant, amazing stuff that can emerge from thinking about stuff that way. But then there's another kind of materialism that wouldn't necessarily be that kind of historical materialism, but would be maybe a, maybe on a, on a more fundamental level, it's a, it's a physical kind of materialism. It's a materialism or another way to put it would be metaphysical, but with a kind of good productive slash between the, the prefix and the, the root of the word. Because, and this materialism would really be asking us to, to get at some questions which Marx kind of assumes the answer to as he proceeds. Questions about what he calls species being, you know. Um, term in German would be Dasein, and, and that's annoying because it turns out to be a term that a philosophical tradition that maybe we don't want to attach ourselves to so emphatically, you know, connects up to there. A sort of phenomenological tradition that not only makes us go through Heidegger, but makes us go through Hegel and makes us go through Kant, you know. And maybe we don't we don't want to do that, but 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 those questions, but but this this other materialism requires us to do it. It requires us to say shit, shit like, you know, well, you know, in the same way that Copernicus kind of allows us to, to, to go against the grain of what shows up in an uncritical way as our empirical, as our experience. You know, Copernicus is kind of going, you know, it, I know it looks like the sun goes around the earth, but, but there's a better explanation for it. It's not even, it's not even empirical really, right? Um, that it turns out that our sense of our own experience is, is faulty. Right. It's not that there isn't an, a general an, an experience. It's just that our interpretation of our experience is faulty, and we have to rethink that. We have to maybe maybe there's a better explanation. It gives us more precise measurements and more precise ways of understanding. Similarly, um, 
it feels like there are these things called individual subjects walking around. It, it feels like I'm one, you know? It seems like um, everything is organized around that feeling. My language is organized around that feeling. My, my, a lot of my hopes and dreams are organized around that feeling. My pleasures, my pains, all, it seems like that. But, but maybe it's not really like that, okay? And maybe there's another kind of materialism that moves by way of another understanding of physics or a rejection of metaphysics if what metaphysics always implies is individuation. Maybe there's another way to think through these things. And it turns out that we have a history of the thinking through of this problem. We, we share a history. We are embedded in, and entangled in a history of the, of the ongoing study of this, this question. Uh, I know it feels like I'm a subject, but yet all the things that, would, that are supposed to accrue to a subject, none of them accrue to me. Okay. Um, there are a whole lot of people in the world who can say stuff like that and they're women and they're, they're not white men for the most part. And then there's a whole bunch of smart white men who can say that too. And they're kind of not white men either to the extent that we call them philosophers, you know, or whatever, or, or psychologists or thinkers, you know, um, because the, the, the imperative not to think is old, you know. Um, so what I'm trying to suggest is, um, you know, we 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 op we we write the work that Stefano and I do is in is in the field is in Black Studies. That's that's our intellectual formation, um, and more specifically, it's an intellectual formation in which the general trajectory of Black Studies has been shaped and altered and shifted by a specifically Black feminist intervention. Okay. Um, and over the course of the last 25 years, it has, it has been shaped and altered in other ways, in other equally profound and important ways, by a kind of queer intervention. And all of these things lead us in the direction of saying that we can't understand our history, nor can we understand our future, if that understanding occurs within the assumption okay, of the absolute facticity yeah. of individual subjectivity. Mm -hmm. That what we're living, what we have been living, okay, and our capacity to continue to live cannot assume, cannot be based on that assumption, okay. Um, and, and for us, this is a materialist intervention. Um, that there is something about the materiality of our lives which is constantly showing us that the assumption of individuation that we walk around in is a faulty assumption. Mm -hmm. So um, so that's what, uh, so we're trying to think about that, you know, and trying to, trying to be with people as we think about that. Yeah, I mean, um, so, Again, I think this is all, you know, really implicit in in in, in Marx, um, you know, in Marx's work, but in, in other think in work of other thinkers too. You know that um, some of it just means tracing the way we think back to a moment in which political e e economy was conceived of as a branch of philosophy and as an extension of moral philosophy. So the Scottish Enlightenment, people like, you know, Adam Smith, you know, who um, within the general context of a rogues gallery wasn't the most roguish of all, but um, Adam Ferguson, um, who I'm trying to read and study a little bit now, just in the last few weeks and, um, but maybe more, most importantly, you know, um, you know, David Hume. And with a figure like Hume and with a figure like Ferguson, 
that's when we become clear about the fact that the emergence of modern philosophy uh, and the emergence of new theories of political economy that are completely bound up with new theories of personhood in which the fundamental crux, the basic ideological and ide ideographic unit of these theories is, is what the great historian George McPherson calls possessive individualism, right? Mm -hmm. We know that the emergence of these theories, the codification of this new modern theory of the subject is inseparable from the emergence of settler colonialism. Mm -hmm. Settler colonialism is, is, is the political, is, is the historical condition of possibility of the new theory of the subject that we get, you know, that, that begins to emerge in the second half of the 18th century in, in Europe, okay? Um, you know, it's just not an accident that, um, that, that as Hume is trying to derive a new theory of, you know, <laughs> new theories of, of, of human subjectivity, he's also interested in the administration of plantations in the Carolinas. This is, they're, they're inseparable from one another, you know? And once you realize that, then you can't get too shocked or surprised when you realize that you know, um, as beautiful as the discourse on love is in Plato's Symposium, when all them people are sitting around on couches trying to tell new stories of the origins of sexual difference, there were slaves bringing them the wine. You know, this is, this is just, it doesn't mean that the philosophy isn't interesting. It doesn't mean that it's not great in some way that we could also call, you know, um, that we sometimes call monstrous monstrosity is great, you know, um, or, or the, you know, it just means, it doesn't mean, I'm not saying don't read anybody. I'm saying read them harder. I'm saying read them more deeply. Um, and it's not just because um, there we'll find the secrets of, of our own degradation or there we'll find the, the techniques of our own, you know, um, you know, uh, uh, incarceration. It's because there's there's interesting and good stuff there too. It's nothing's that the the, the term entanglement is a is a has increasing popularity now, and it sometimes I think it makes people feel good, you know, that if if you think there's something wrong with individuation and separability and non affectability, if you think there's something wrong with the raising of those notions to the level of ideals and entanglement gives you a kind of comfort it's just that it's a complex comfort because because as much as i would want to be my heart is warmed by the sense of being entangled with you matt or you mario it also means i got to deal with my entanglement with some people that i don't like you see <laughs> and some shit that i don't like you know um and that places upon us a set of moral and ethical demands, okay? Um, now, who knows something about living with these moral and ethical demands? Who are the folks who have long been studying and enacting the moral and ethical problems of entanglement at the level of, say, of justice, right? Who's got theories of justice that are predicated on the inescapable fact of entanglement rather than the belief in radical separation, which is the metaphysical condition of possibility of incarceration, right? You see, who are the folks who know something about that? Well, um, you're more likely to find something out about that in a village on a mountaintop in Oaxaca state than you are in you know, a philosophy class at Oxford. It doesn't mean the philosophy class at Oxford isn't interesting. It just means they have their they have limitations. Mm -hmm. um, and so uh, here, this thing of you 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 use the term theft of indigenous knowledge, um, and I think that's a, a useful and important term, and it's it's right. Um, it's just that the alternative that we might put forward to the theft of indigenous knowledge would be something like what we might call the gift of indigenous knowledge, right? We don't want these rapacious motherfuckers to steal it. 
because we want to give it to them is what I would say because it turns out that the capacity of the earth to sustain human life is is dependent upon the spread of this knowledge you know it's it's horrific to have something be stolen okay and the primary modality that theft takes is in the imposition of on something of the idea that it could be owned in the first place you see so um anyway all, all i'm saying is you're it's yeah the, the the theft of indigenous knowledge is a real thing a, a, a historical thing a, 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 a thing that it would be wrong to to deny the reality of it um but by the same token um, this knowledge, in order for it to flourish, in order for it to do the work that I, that hopefully, that, that, that we think it can do, it's got to be shared. Shared, not stolen. Shared, not owned. You see? Firstly, thank you. This talk was great. Um, I have a question that's kind of harkens back to what we were saying about healthcare and working class healthcare workers, predominantly being working class women of color, servicing working class people. I wanted to know what your thoughts may be on in terms of demystifying any side, type of separation that exists, because I come from a family of healthcare workers, uh, black women, and unfortunately, because sometimes when working class people end up working in institutions, they start to absorb some of the ideologies of these institutions toward their own people. Mm -hmm. So what does this kind of demystification look like? What do you think a political education would look like in that context? Um, and how do we get people to identify with the institutions that, that are really exploiting their labor last as opposed to first? I mean, I, I don't think I have an a answer that's, uh, <laughs> that's not already embedded in your question. You know, I mean, I feel like most of the time, you know, when we ask questions like that, it's because we already know, you know? It's kind of like, I always call it, it's like that, that feel me variety of questions, you know, where you, you don't ask somebody feel me unless you know they do already. You know, it's, it's, a, it's a moment of, so, so I think the, the answer is already given there, first of all, in what people could call or used to call, you know, political education. Um, it, it, it means, See, I think stuff, I think, I just feel like people start to, you know, when, 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 what, I, so I'm not answering this as if, I'm not, I, we just talking, right? Yeah, please. So I'm not trying to, I'm not, I'm not trying to answer the question as if I have an answer to the question or as if I've, well, I've been studying this for many years. So let me give you some of my thoughts. No, it's more like I can tell you what happened with, with, with me and, and, and some of my friends, but primarily my two best friends, you know, and how they came to be my best friends. I don't know. That's a whole other story that I got to try to figure out at a certain point. Um, but but Stefano, you know, who we've been friends for 35 years, and my partner, Laura Harris, we've been together for 30 years. And this is what, you know, basically what we do, did was what folks do. We would sit around and talk about the conditions under which we worked, okay? And we would try to figure out why the conditions under which we work were so bad, why it had to be that way. Why is it that something that we went into because we thought we would enjoy it, and we thought not just that we would enjoy it, but that it was a good thing to do. See, I believe that most people, if they decide that they want to become a, you know, a healthcare worker or a nurse, that 
you know, that, que- you know, people, only a cynical society would treat it as a cliche. When I believe people when they say they want to help people. Like, they want to take care of people. Like, they feel like it's a way, it's a really profound and important way of sharing pleasure. Okay? Even within the, even under conditions of, of duress, of grief, of loss, of pain, they get some, and I've been around folks enough to know the folks who helped take care of my grandmother, you know? Uh, and I've also know that under those conditions, some of those same folks, like when you talk about taking on that, that kind of ideological, mm-hmm. I heard, I heard them, I heard them say things. I heard, I heard my grandma say things. I mean, it was, it wasn't like it was all pretty, but there were these ways that people figured out how to share. Okay. And what I think people were fighting was how it is that this became an industry, okay? How it is that it became an industry in which the, the, the fundamental condition was how you guard yourself and your interest against the interest of others, particularly the interest of, say, the people who you were actually supposed to be trying to help. This, this was a formation that I think you could see at work, a, a, a structure that you could see at work in a nursing home or in a hospital, where literally the patient becomes your enemy. Their interests are against your interests, right? Same, you know, some of y'all in here maybe are academics and you, you know, or you're in grad school and it doesn't take very, it doesn't take but about six months of grad school before <laughs> your students are understood by you to be your enemy, that their interests don't coincide with yours because you're fighting over this very, very precious thing called time, mm-hmm. right? That, right? So, so all of the pleasure that, why'd you go into it? Well, I'm weird, I'm a nerd. I like to sit around and talk about weird, cool shit with other people who are just, and I can't, I can't seem to do no better. It's, it's, it's so bad, I can't, I just can't imagine doing anything else. You know, I, 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 you know, I mean, I just, it's just, I just can't, I just can't go that long without talking about Coltrane. I just can't do it. <laughs> and I needed to find some other people. And, and wow, there's a place you could go where there are such people and you can do it. And you get there, you're like, why does this suck? Why are we? I like to take care of people. I've been doing it ever since I was five. I had a dog, and I took care of my dogs. Okay, I, 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 I would try. I would find a, a bird that fell out of a tree and want to take care. I wanted. I, it just didn't seem like there was any possible thing that could be better than that. Yeah. And this is what I wanted to do. And it doesn't take but about six months before you like. That person is my enemy, okay? This person whose face I'm wiping or body who I'm bathing, okay, the political economics of this is such that they are the ones who I have to understand myself to be in an antagonist. Okay, so all I'm trying to say is these are conditions, that they, they place us under conditions where it makes it seem like this is so. And the way we can get out of these bad thoughts is by getting together with one another to, to, to celebrate those inklings that we have, mm. those, those, those sometimes isolated moments in which you are reminded of the thing that you went there to do in the first place. And you were reminded of the pleasures of it. And you say, okay, what I want to know is how come it doesn't feel this good all the time? And once you ask that question, I don't think it's a big, it's a lot, it's mysterious Mm. to try to understand why. So the question, and then you also begin to understand all of the different barriers that have been placed against your being able to collectively ask that question. Yes. Which is why it's like you said, man, it's good to have a place where you can get together and think. Mm. And people used to go to church, you know, or, or wherever. You know, because this is, and it turns out, again, this is why it's really important that the capacity to get together and think in defense, right, of our capacity to get together and think is, um, is so much more, is, it's not only that it's more important to focus on that than it is to focus on what devils do. It's also because most of what devils do 
almost all of what devils do is meant to regulate and exploit and own and liquidate our capacity to get together and think about what we do okay so um so i'm not saying all that like i got the answer that you didn't already have i'm just agreeing with the question you see? it gave so. me some insight i appreciate it <laughs> but it's because we talk together you see that's it's not because it's what happened is it we talked about it together and we remind each other of what we know you know i mean socrates wasn't all wrong about, <laughs> you know a lot of things so what i'm interested in is that this idea of the subaltern as not having the capacity to be affected right and i think about you know studies of how they say um black women that go to you know hospitals or to the doctors their experiences of pain are often dismissed as yeah. mm -hmm. um, not true so they're not getting the same kind of care that mm -hmm. other people are mm -hmm. so i guess i'm trying to like reconcile that right um, affectability and but also granting the capacity to be affected mm -hmm. yeah i mean um well, I've always thought, um, okay, so I'm going to see, I hope I can keep on a track. Um, so you have to bear with me. Um, because we were talking about this the other day, you know, it's like, um, I remember when I was, uh, <laughs> when I flunked out of college, um, I was working at the Nevada test site um, as a janitor. But right before the end of my freshman year, I had seen um, Apocalypse Now. And, and I would probably say that that was like a big moment for me in the sense of making me realize. You know, you know how sometimes you, you, it's not like you get everything, but, but there's something that maybe it's, it's, it wasn't a big, it wasn't a huge mystery to me, you know? Like I, you sort of find out that it's hard, but you can read it, you know, or, you know, that's a hard problem, but you can do it, you know, that kind of thing, you know? So, um, so anyway, I was really, you know, propelled along this sort of literary path that Apocalypse Now kind of fictionalizes within the context of the movie, so. So when Kurtz is reciting the Hollow Men, you know, so that that pre that pushes you out towards Elliot, which had who had already assimilated Conrad in various ways, and then that pushes you out back towards a whole range of, you know, out into a certain kind of literary history, and one of the places that it pushes you out is Dante in the Divine Comedy, and I remember I got this copy of Divine Comedy and had all these notes. And I was trying to figure out how to understand the Ptolemaic sort of system, you know, the Ptolemaic theory of the universe, right? And all the epicycles, you know. And I thought, man, it's amazing how much brilliant intellectual work these guys had to do so that they could stay wrong. <laughs> <laughs> you know, um, that, that it was really like a kind of, um, that 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 particular cosmology was like it was trying to maintain a kind of cascade failure, right? Every time you shored up one eye, one thing, another one would break, you know. But you kept having to do it. You kept having to fix it, and 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 it became more and more and more and more elaborate, you know. Epicycles of epicycles of it. Um, so that there's this kind of weird thing where, on the one hand, it's kind of stupid. Because there's a much simpler, easier way to understand the universe. And on the other hand, there's something brilliant and ingenious about it. Because look at all that beautiful, weird, filigree work you had to do, you know? Okay. Um, in a slightly, I wouldn't use the word beautiful or anything, but I would say that the maintenance of racism is similar. It's really fucking stupid. But there's a certain amount of impressive intellectual work that has been done in order to maintain it. And it produces these weird ass paradoxes, okay? 
So one such paradox would be how it is the case that people who are understood to be radically outside of and excluded from the human, which is to say you can never claim humanity without a contest. You have no easy sort of access to it. You are just assumed to be inhuman. You are assumed to be outside of the human and your status outside of the human actually guarantees and structures what is inside the human. And at the same time, at the very same time, you can be conceived of as the essence of the human, right? So how is it that, and it produces an interesting philosophical conundrum. How is it that the essence of a thing can be outside of that thing, right? And it's not, you know, but it's, like I said, it's, it's you know, if you studied it purely in an abstract way, you would say, well, this is an interesting phenomenon, how they came up with this kind of shit, you know? Um, <laughs> um, so that's a long-winded way to say that it's of course perfectly possible within the general theory of within a general theory of human activities that is predicated on misogyny and on racism and maybe in and in a more and in a different way particularly anti-blackness and anti-indigeneity right mm -hmm. It's perfectly clear how it is the case that the positing of individual subjects within the field of in the indigenous and the black and the female, right? It's perfectly clear how it is the case that such a subject could be seen as both radically ineffectable and totally affectable at the same time. It, it's it's matter of fact it's a necessity of the theory yes. that these two things can go together right this is again so it's like those epicycles it's it's contradictory and it doesn't make a whole lot of sense from outside of that mode of thinking but within that mode of thinking it's absolutely necessary okay that a woman or a black person or an indigenous person could be seen of as both let's say in Thomas Jefferson as both hyper ardent in their feelings mm -hmm. and at the same time radically unrefined so that those very feelings about which uh, that 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 are that are given with such ardency can also be conceived of as not real mm -hmm. right that's how you get that's how you convince yourself that it's okay okay to rape the half sister of your dead wife okay when she's 14 15 years old and to continue to do so and then to own the your children, the, the, the children that are created out of this 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 union. That's how it's possible to do that and still conceive of yourself as a thinker. Right? As an innovative fully, you know, right? That's that's how you could do that shit. It's 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 you know, I mean, there's a kind of neo-Kantian philosophical discourse on what people call self-delusion, and that's that's how that works, right? So the point is, I think, with regard to Denise's work, Denise Ferreira da Silva, who's, because um, I don't believe in individuation, it's hard for me to say something like smartest person in the world. But, um, but if I was going to say it about anybody, I would say it about her, you know. Um, her whole thing. I think, and, and I hope I don't get it wrong, and y'all have to have her, you know, we'll rig up something so she can get here and then she can come. But but um, I think it's like, you know, the, the emergence of the philosophical, of the, you know, the, the, the modern, the, the subject of modern philosophy, okay, that, that, that model of personhood is predicated on the belief in, in, in a radical non-affectability, okay? In part because, what it would mean to be affective, affectable, would mean that you don't have autonomy over your own actions, that you are incapable of what T.S. Eliot would call self-possession, right? That you are driven by appetites, okay? That you, um, and that you are suitable, therefore, as a kind of thing, okay? Suitable to, 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 be, to being um, constrained and driven and forced by others, right? In so far as you have a lack, a fundamental absence of internal volition, right? So affectability 
is implies that literally that you can be touched, that you can be shaped, that you can be turned, right? That that your that that not only that, but that your your will, your mind, your ideas, they're not your own, but that they are in some fundamental way shared, right? Okay. And so it goes against the grain of the very possibility of the individuation of that subject. And that subject must be individuated because that individuation is a conditioned possibility of ownership, which is the general structure of the social that these ideas in, imply. Okay, so um, so I think the trouble, of course, is being affectable is no joke. It it means you get messed up, um, and you can be messed up by hate. And be messed up by brutality, but but what'll really mess you up even more than Nils will mess you up is love yeah. and kindness. That'll really jack you up. That really renders your capacity for self possession and 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 un, 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 untenable. Okay, so you know, again, affectability and entanglement are not they're not what one might call they're not easy. <laughs> they, 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 they are not easy conditions to live within. They require massive amounts of work, you see. Um, and, um, but, but they are the condition within which we live. And at the same time, that condition is under brutal forms of duress by modes of political economic organization that are structured around the denial of that condition. Mm -hmm. so, um, so, yeah, it's, it, but, but and, and that denial produces those kinds of intellectual conundra that you were describing where, yeah, we can be both impervious to pain and at the same time, totally oversensitive to pain, mm -hmm. you know, you know. Um, it's it's <laughs> it's uh this is a <laughs> as Malcolm X used to say, this is a silly man. <laughs> uh, we can take maybe one or two more, but just to continue with the church thing, we're gonna pass around a donation <laughs> jar. Um, this is part of a fundraising series. We have an Indiegogo going now. It's a crowdfunding thing, and we're happy that Fred came as part of this event series we've been doing to kind of get some visibility to the thing so we can stay here in the space. Can you do things like that? So you just contribute a few bucks or whatever you can. That would be really helpful. Um, and then we have some more things coming up. On Thursday, Natasha Leonard's going to talk about authenticity and truth and the kind of media, the kind of liberal kind of issues with dealing with fascism now. Uh, that'll be Thursday night, and Daniel Tucker is going to come next Sunday to talk about local control. He's an artist and professor. Um, but yeah, we want to take a couple more. Thanks, Fred. We'll stay for as long as uh, you have the stamina and energy, and, and people are welcome to stay for dinner as well afterwards. Um, but yeah, if there's some more uh, thoughts or ideas, respond. John? So, uh, I was Bear with me while I try to organize my thoughts as I'm speaking. But I, I guess I wanted to ask you to examine something connected to affectability, but also what you were talking about, about um, health workers and graduate students, which I guess is also a result of the structure that you were also talking about, the economic structure, um, which is, I'm a student at Borough of Manhattan Community College, and a lot of times during the past semester, I feel like I've seen my professors who are mo mostly very passionate about their subjects, um, kind of like maybe waver in their belief in what they're doing or, or like maybe, they're just kind of like, why am I here? Like dealing with these people trying to teach them something about something that like I care a lot about but they don't even seem to possibly grasp or care and that to me seems like an experience also shared by 
healthcare workers or social workers or numerous fields. Artists. Where, yeah. And so, like, how do you, like, it's, it's, it's like you're, you're so disappointed that maybe you stop trying or like you, 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 you don't want to teach these people anymore. It's just like a job. Mm -hmm. like you don't want to help these people. You're just going through the motion. Like, how do you deal with that? <laughs> well, um, <laughs> go ahead. No, I was, I was telling um, our friend here that it's my first semester at King. I just got out of a PhD program, and, and Matt, my roommate Jack, you know, know, know the story is that exactly the same things you, you actually pointed out, and it's good to hear that from a student. Yeah, I thought only faculty <laughs> professors only think about these things, but yeah, I think um, one thing I also would kind of sorry, piggyback on the question is really this kind of idea of complacency, right, in relation to all these things that we've been talking about tonight. Like, it's easy to be complacent in this scenario. Right. Yeah, but like the complacency hardens into like like I feel like it becomes it's it's the way that the people you're supposed to work with become your enemy. Yeah. Yeah. I, and it's also like the period for student evaluation. I kind of think that was enemies. Yeah. Um so I'm trying to um Again, with uh, I really wish, uh, not only because cause I don't have the words for it by myself, but also just because I think he would have had a good time tonight too, but I wish Stefan over here because we've been thinking about this a lot um, and, and we were thinking about it in by way of this word. Uh, I always think about, um, if you've ever read, um, Zora Neale Hurston's Their Eyes Are Watching God. There's a kind of, uh, there's this beautiful moment at the very beginning of the novel where she's coming back home to Eatonville, Janie and all the folks are sitting on their porches gossiping and wondering what happened to her as she was off on her travels. And she doesn't want to be bothered with all of them because she doesn't feel that their concern for her is a friendly concern. But she's got one friend named Phoebe who brings her a plate of food and, and says, I'll tell you, Phoebe, you know, and then you can tell them whatever you want to tell them, she says. But, but the phrase she uses is that my, my, uh, my tongue is in my friend's mouth. And um, so this is maybe the way, the word that we've been using to try to describe or to try to name that condition. Um, and it's also connected to affectability or connected to entanglement is, is complicity. Um, and, and, but you have to imagine, I mean, Stefano's dad was a, uh, I mean, some of his family is Italian. And so that was another language in their house. And, um, and it was very much through that, at least in part that, connection maybe in our work to sort of certain kinds of autonomous thought you know come out of Italy but the, the point is complicity so, sounds so much better if you say it in Italian you know, <laughs> uh, complicita you know? and all of a sudden it's cause, and, the, and, there, and there's a different valence where it doesn't just mean having been sucked in by an evil system to do the deeds of that evil system but it also just means a mode of being with people in 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 some sort of condition of sharing that is um that can go either way is the point okay um and a whole lot of the things that we've been giving talks in the fall and a lot of times we get these questions where people are like um and again i'm stefano could say this so much better than me um 
but people are wondering about the complicity, you know, like with the Amazon. Yeah, I hate them, but but I just I really needed some vitamin, you know, or whatever. <laughs> um, and I couldn't, and they and they've fucked up. They've created the condition under which I can't get it any other way except through them, you know. Um, so, you know, um, you know, so so the comp so the, now people, I think. You know, there's a great Marxian tradition of the study of what people call alienation. Mm -hmm. And one way to think about alienation is that it manifests itself in that moment of, I hate my job, the, the conditions under which I would want to do what I do, my capacity to, to literally sort of own the conditions of my labor and set those conditions have been, are under such duress and now I'm just going through the motions, I hate it, you know. Um, but what if alienation comes before that? What if alienation comes not at the moment in which you're the teacher who is frustrated by students who don't seem to give a shit about what you're trying to impart to them. And you devoted your life, 30 years of your life to studying Henry V, you know, or, or you know, Shakespeare's history plays, and they just don't care. They just don't give a damn. You know, and, and you're just tired of it now. You just want to. But what if alienation actually comes 10 years before that, when you really still think that you're imparting all this important stuff to your students mm -hmm. and, and they love you and you're charismatic and they give you good recommendations, <laughs> right? Or good, good evaluations. Because what you think is, is that even though all these other classes suck, and even though the university is all fucked up and you know it, you found your own individual way through the shit that, that allows you not to be complicit. Well, what we've been thinking, and Stefano especially is like, no, that, that desire for a kind of individualized avoidance of complicity mm -hmm. is false. In fact, it's better to just deepen the fucking complicity. We're all up in here. We're up in this shit. I mean, I'm thinking now of most death, you know. There's that moment where, like in, uh, in, in, in Close Edge, which is my favorite, one of my favorite moments in, because I can't listen to hip hop that much anymore, I'm too old now. But, <laughs> but uh, there's that one moment in the song where he goes, we all here, it's all good. Mm -hmm. that, that's, an, that, that's the kind of complicity where you say we all here, even though, and it is all good, but it ain't all good. Mm -hmm. but, it's, but, but, that, but it's better than the alternative which would be some individualized flight, mm -hmm. some individualized negotiation that you had worked out with a fucked up system mm -hmm. that allows you to teach your classes better than the other people teach. Nah, uh -uh. it's all fucked up. None of this shit's livable. It's all bad. So what we gotta do is figure out a way to get together and figure out how to do this shit different, okay? Mm -hmm. and, and with regard to teaching specifically, we know some of the reasons how come it don't work. It's the, the first of all, people are worried, you know, if, if my students got, you know, even, well, I'm, you know, NYU is not the same as UC Riverside, but it ain't as different as you would think. It's hungry students at NYU too, okay? Riverside students didn't have enough to eat and they didn't have enough time. And they're working 30 hours a week at Chipotle making burritos for people, okay? And then they, and they got to ride the bus two hours from San Bernardino to Riverside to get to class and then figure out how they're going to get back. OK. And it turns out we're all in the service industry. Right. And, and, and then we have to wonder why in the fuck did service become an industry? How did that happen? OK. Not because and, and the question, and the problem ain't service. The problem is industry. Service is cool. Right. Um, you know, um, it's good to serve. Okay, um, but how could, but, but what happens when you industrialize service and when it becomes part of a profit? You know, there, there's some questions we can ask and we ask the questions not because we don't know, but because we do know. The point of asking the questions is to be with the people that you're asking the questions with, right? That, that's how catechism, that's how church was, that's the catechism, right? You know, you know, you go to church every Sunday and you know the answers, but you're there to be with the other people who mm. also know the answers. Right. Because it feels good and because you can work some stuff out. So. Um, I can't wrap it all. You know what I'm saying? But 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 we know how come it feels bad. 
some of why. We know how come it feels bad for you as a student. We know how come it feels bad for us as teachers. Interestingly, what I find, like, you know, I mean, I ain't supposed to go to McDonald's because, you know, but, but I go, it's one right across the street from work. So I just, and I end up having 15 minutes to eat. And so that's how I can get something to eat. But I've always been fast. I never worked in McDonald's. Okay. But I remember my old friend, my old colleague, Jose Munoz, he used to get mad sometimes because students would come to office hours and just demand shit, just demand, you know. And he'd be like, do you want fries with that? <laughs> and, we used to, and we used to make, we used to laugh at the kids who worked at McDonald's across, because they had this kind of amazing, very, they had a way of letting you know that you were the lowest possible. I mean, like, <laughs> like, like they, had, they, they had a way of saying, hi, may I help you? That meant, fuck you, I don't want to help you. Like, you know, like how am I, am I help you? you know, like, and it was like, but there was, but what was clear was that they had figured out a way in the midst of that drudgery to have some fun. And every once in a while you could see them doing it, right? And it wasn't, um, and it wasn't easy. They, I mean, they had to work to figure that out and to enact it. And I feel like in the university, we're under less constraint and less duress than them. So if we can't figure out how to have some fun. Cause the provost doesn't come to your, to your class. <laughs> the deans don't come. They don't, they don't. So, so you, you know, and people have been lying, you know, forever, you know. <laughs> um, if you had to pick 140 pounds of cotton and your partner's quota was 120 pounds, but they were eight months pregnant and could only pick 80 pounds, then you had to try to figure out a way to pick 40 extra pounds of cotton so that you could put some in her bag. Or maybe put a watermelon in the bag. Or maybe put some rocks in the bag. Um, I don't believe that it's l more difficult for people who have been studying precisely the kinds of shit that I just mentioned mm -hmm. and who therefore have access to a history of lying and stealing for good, right? We should be able to figure out some ways for the shit to be more fun. So we have to, we can do that. We can do that. Um, so, but we can't do it by pretending that you're the only cool teacher or you can't do it by being in a class and sitting around looking at all the other folks who are asleep and going, why don't, why are they asleep? Why don't they appreciate their chance to get this education? I've had students, you know, why are you giving me, you know, why are you giving everybody an A? My A, you know, those people don't even, you know, right? we, we can't get it that way, you know, but, um. Yeah. Maybe last question from Mia, or or maybe we'll take both questions and then you can respond. Yeah. Um, my is um, yeah, but what about complacency? Then? Complacency. You know what I'm saying? Because I'm with you on the deeper into the complicity, and then we all figure out a way how to get the fuck out of it. But then <laughs> you know, complacency is usually where I, where you end up, like in that limbo space. Mm -hmm. oh, and then I was going to say thank you. And um, do you give grades? I teach at the new school and I'm mm -hmm. interested to, I have a struggle around grades, uh, around giving grades, around not giving everyone an A. Mm -hmm. Okay. And then, and then the other thing is I was in a conversation the other night with Michael Dawson, who's writing a thing on racial capitalism, and he um, he's writing this thing, and he's got you quoted all up in there. And we were we were saying how wonderful it is that he is reaching toward this stretching against disciplinarity, and um, the conversation ended on whether we can differentiate between white supremacy and capitalism. And um, we, many of us were saying no, and he was saying he's not sure. So I just wanted to 
ask what you thought about that. Um, well, I deal with the complacency first. <laughs> <laughs> uh, oh, uh, yeah. yeah. Well, maybe you want to take that before I jump. <laughs> I say that one for <laughs> um, I just I'm I'm thinking about this situation of what you're talking about, the essence and the ontic and that being a kind of drive. Um, and perhaps this kind of this space that we keep on coming back to, this next space or this space where we're going to be together and it's gonna be complicated and it's gonna be tentacular and all the all those language. But um, I think I have particular questions about how in the position of kind of subjectivity and blackness and how those roles get kind of, those folks get a position as a kind of vehicle in the process of producing clarity or making space or perhaps offering offering openings to a space that we can also name. Yeah. And the role of maybe disappearance or, and you see sometimes, and the thing is I also don't know the language because I wonder how much that next space would actually not be in English. I mean, the other word I guess I would use, you know, that maybe you could use interchangeably with complacency is settling. Mm -hmm. When we talk about people who are, you know, complacency, we're not talking about, usually not talking about happiness. Mm -hmm. You know, you're just talking about, well, it's, I guess this is about as good as it's going to get, so, so I'll, this is okay, right? Um, and I, the one thing, you know, I have a bad I you know, one talks about him, uh, at least according to C.L.R. James, who seems usually, as far as I can tell, always to be right. <laughs> For him, Jefferson is an important figure in the history of political theory simply because of the phrase pursuit of happiness, right? Um, and the, the more I teach, particularly at elite institutions, or the, let's say that maybe the fanciest place I ever taught was at Duke. And what was clear to me was that, um, the, you know, the children of the white upper middle class were complacent in that sense of they they had already settled against the grain of anything like a pursuit of happiness by the time they were 19 years old. And they would tell you that, you know, well, I know I'm not going to be happy. I'm, I'm not going into what they call eye banking because I'm trying to be happy or trying to pursue happiness. I'm just trying to maintain that I'm, they settled, in other words. And that sense of settlement is, in, is totally bound up with the settlement that we refer to when we talk about settler colonialism. These are, these are you know, in other words, one way to think about that kind of complacency, it is, it's precisely what Weber calls the Protestant ethic, you know. Um, and it is constitutes the spirit of capitalism that to settle, okay, for a kind of profound unhappiness that is then predicated on some fundamental belief in your lack of, in, in your in your inability to deserve anything else, okay. Happiness, though, it's important to think about it precisely under the rubric of pursuit, not um, not capture. You ain't catching it. You, you, you chase, you're going after it. And in moving towards it, in that fugitive way, you know, the fugitivity, as Nate Mackey says, it's not just about running from something, it's also running to something, mm -hmm. right? But you don't arrive, you don't get there, you know? Um, so that this other space, the next space, you know, this is why we're anti-Zionists. Mm -hmm. And it's also why we're anti-Zionists, right? Where Zion here, could refer to the state of Israel in that way, but it also refers to wherever that place that where they were at in the matrix, you know, and it wasn't, it was, it's not all good. And, and you get there and you'd be like, I'm like, I'm ready to go. Right. <laughs> Got, gotta go, you know, and that's, that's not a, it's the pursuit, you know, that that's crucial. And that's, um, you know, but I don't think about it in terms of, how one then would the 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 the, the, the chance or the, the danger of losing one's life force it's just these are the these are the conditions under which we share the life force you know and 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 those conditions are 
either denial, <laughs> which produces all kinds of misery, or service, right? Which, which, you know, and 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 so, um, and you know, there's a lot of. St it's look. I mean, I, I was, I was, I was. Steve and I were doing this thing at, at this place in, in Manhattan. And it was it the, the pub? So on 37th, we couldn't figure out how they paid for it. It was weird. The People's, right? Forum. The People's Forum. We were like, where did they get that? You know. Uh, well, I don't. I don't really probably want to know. But it was. But it was. But it was interesting, and it was this guy, Mark Novak, who's been teaching this creative writing course with workers, and these, and these nannies were there reciting poetry, really interesting. And I kept thinking to myself, you know, my grandmother, they didn't call them a nanny. She just, she cleaned up white folks' houses and took care of their kids. Didn't have a name, it was just, well, it, well, it was in a, it was in a transitional period between slave and nanny, you know, or whatever. Um, and she had to deal with this fundamental contradiction of like, um, you know, what do you do about having to love those kids? Mm. Okay. What do you do about the fact that having to love them is, is, a, is a profound, brutal imposition? And the only thing worse than having to love them is not loving them and what that does not just to you but to everybody right at your own house you know right so you got to live that okay now i have student troy zell car he was like so are you basically he came to my office are you basically telling me that is that, that black folks have to save the world I was like, yeah. <laughs> Black folks and poor folks and trans people and queer people, yeah. The ones who have been fucked with the most. Mm -hmm. Why? Not just because they don't like us, but because, not, not because we're not wanted, but because we are. Under both modalities of that term. You know, the, the, the police version of the term as well as the, the desire Freud version. You know. Yeah, this is, um, you know, now, the condition of possibility under which we would be able to share that burden would be if other people who had constructed themselves around the denial that they also bear that burden decided to come to own up to the fact that they also bear that burden. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, no, because it's just this, this, there's this earth. This is where we at. This is what we got. So what are you going to do? I, you know, I'm not. Is it fair? No, it's not fair. It's completely unfair, which just goes to show you that John Rawls was wrong and justice ain't got nothing to do with fairness. <laughs> fairness is some shit that your seven year old comes up with. Right. <laughs> your precocious seven year old who's really pissed off about the fact that instead of him getting more, the other one got more. That's who starts talking about fairness and shit. It's a childish theory. OK. It's it's it ain't got nothing to do with that. It just really ain't. It's just got something to do with like, well, this is what, you know, this is, you know, there's some people who recognize that this is what has to be done. And there's some other motherfuckers who don't recognize it. It would be cool if we could share this work. But if I even but if we can't share the work, I still got we still got to do the work. Mm -hmm. You know, um, and, and it's even worse than that. Because not only do I got to do the work anyway, even though you ain't going to fucking help, but it fucking really debilitates my capacity to do the work if I'm mad at your ass all the time about it. You know? Um, it's just, there's just no, it just, it, 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 the depths of the shit, it's unfathomable. Okay. The, this, this problematic of fairness and responsibility. Okay. It, it just... Which is another way of saying that the relationship between capitalism and white supremacy is asymptotic. They're different from one another, I think. 
but they're infinitely close to one another. <laughs> the distance between them is unbridgeable at the same time as it is immeasurably small. Okay. And so um, you can't think about one without thinking about the other. Um, you can't think about one as if it is inseparable from the other. Um, but the difference between them is a, is a real difference. And, um, and, it, and, it, and, you, and, and it means that the, the way that difference strangely operates is that you can't think about anything like the end of capitalism without understanding something about and trying to eradicate and obliterate you know um you know white supremacy and the opposite is the vice versa is also true <laughs> um but um yeah so um so you know but it's very 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 difficult in incalculably difficult to imagine to figure out how to to enact the the end of these things it's just that however immeasurably difficult it is to do that it's easier to do that than it is to do the impossible thing namely live underneath live and live in this shit <laughs> so um so we can either keep trying to do the impossible or get busy trying to do the incalculably hard you know which turns out is what we've been doing anyway um we just call it survival we call it surviving genocide <laughs> and uh so um they they the, They'll kill every one of us, but they can't kill us all. Mm -hmm. so. well, Fred, thank you so much. Thank you.